So welcome. Uh, so I, I, I invited uh, Professor Kag. I, invited, I first met him at a workshop I put together called Security Human Behavior, which looks at security and people and how, how the two interact. And uh, he gave a great talk about, about drones, but actually something that, that really interests me, which I always think of as societal phase changes, when more of something changes what the thing is. Uh, there's a book on, on drone warfare written with a uh, political scientist. And it's interesting, it's a book that goes into law, politics, and, and ethics of drones. So I suspect we're going to get more of the philosophy ethics in this part of the talk. So uh, please. Great. So thanks, Bruce. I appreciate it. So um, today we're going to talk about the moral hazard of drones. Um, I became interested in this uh, topic in 2006 when I was going through my MPhil in international relations at Cambridge. Um, and I was asked in an essay, or rather in an exam, what's going to be the most important sort of uh, phase change in uh, military technology in the next uh, 100 years. I picked drones. And it turned out that it sort of uh, shaped the way that I thought about research for the next 10 years, or a uh, better part of a decade. So um, Sarah and I just put out this book. And it began with a, um, from a New York Times article entitled The Moral Hazard of Drones. And um, a moral hazard is a term that uh, started in the insurance agent industry um, at the turn of the 19th, 20th century. Um, a moral hazard is a situation in which an individual or a party is willing to take part in either risky or immoral behavior if they don't have to face the consequences associated with that, those actions. Okay? Philosophers in economics now call that the moral hazard. Okay? So um, the insurance in industry discovered that people who were insured actually were much worse drivers or much, more, uh, much less care careful. And so they adjusted premiums and uh, incentives uh, sort of liabilities uh, in order to adjust uh, the behavior of drivers. But we've yet figured out how to adjust the behaviors associated with drone operation. So um, when I first started to think through the moral hazard of drones, it really, um, I was really worried about the leadership associated with uh, the US leadership uh, when it came to the drones program. That's where I started. And it generated uh, the first article, The Moral Hazard of jo Drones. And here I argue that um, the costless nature of drone warfare, and I realize that this is not qualitatively different, uh, as Bruce was talking about at the beginning, it's not qualitatively different than, say, um, a sniper, for example, or a long-range long precision guided munition. Um, but the costless nature of this type of warfare made leaders more inclined to take up these types of tactics and these types of strategies. Um, in other words, to make military um, solutions the first uh, option rather than the last resort. Or this was my concern initially. Um, so in the second article, Drones, Ethics, and the Armchair so Soldier, I begin to look more carefully at the way that uh, soldiers might face this moral hazard as well. Um, the moral hazard being uh, Clem Ryan, who's at Oxford, has done a study on disassociation and the way that distance creates um, a situation in which soldiers are more inclined to take viol violent or lethal a action and more, more readily, uh, more ready to do so. So underneath all of this, um, the, these more specific points about drone warfare is a deep and long-standing question about ethics and the relationship between expediency and morality, OK? So the question is, is, is let's ask Sarah. Sarah. <laughs> Sarah, is, uh, like, the problem that I, uh, I'm sort of pushing on here is, is convenience a virtue? The answer is, of course, no, OK? <laughs> uh, but, but, in our, but in our society, uh, we, ge we generally think that convenience is not only a virtue, but an extremely important virtue, OK? So uh, underlying my concern with drones is the thought that that which is uh, easier is not always better. And additionally, that which is easier should actually be more morally suspect than those things that are hard to accomplish. And the reason might go something like this. 
the things that are hard have other, uh, have prudential or instrumental <laughs> reasons to go against them. In other words, if we think about long-range ballistic missiles, if we think about carpet bombing, if we think about uh, traditional, um, any types of traditional ballistics, there are good prudential reasons to be s suspicious of them. In other words, uh, if we think about traditional warfare and the very obvious devastation it creates uh, during the 1970s, for example, there was widespread concern about ballistic missiles and you know the um, delivery systems associated with nuclear armaments, right? But uh, the dangers of these were obvious. There was no rhetoric about their precision. There was no rhetoric about uh, the cleanliness of them. And so prudential and instrumental concerns actually covered some of our bases. You know, like Truman, uh, Truman says, uh, our morality needs to catch up with our technology. But 50 years ago, our morality didn't need to catch up with our technology. The instrumental simply, the, the, the cost-benefit analysis associated with those technologies did that work for us. Okay? Now this has changed a little bit when it comes to, for example, precision guided munitions and drone capabilities. Instrumental reasoning and prudential reasoning is no longer going to cover uh, those types of technologies because the, the, the force projection is rhetoric, the rhetoric surrounding force projection is clean, costless, efficient, at least for the populations that are pushing, uh, pushing those, uh, there's a little hesitation, but you know, it, it clean and costless on the side of the U.S. public, okay? Now, um, one of the concerns that I had um, associated with leaders way back in uh, 2011, not way back, but back in 2011, is that clandestine activities has, have always been at the disposal of uh, political leaders, but never in the history of warfare ha have the um, costs associated with those clandestine activities been so low. Um, after 9-11, after the War Powers Resolution and the authorization of military force, when that came out, um, there's a concern that military leaders are given carte blanche to sort of uh, move unilaterally in clandestine activities outside of traditional battle zones or war zones. That's a concern that I had. So Mike Kazenko, writing in a Council on Foreign Relations report, writes, despite nearly 10 years of non-battlefield targeted killings, no, no congressional committee has conducted a hearing on any aspect of them. Okay. Now the question is, why? I think that um, I think that there are many ways to answer that question, um, and I'd be interested interested to sort of talk those out in the next in the question and answer period. But one thing that I'd like us to think about is that as our the precision the precision of our technical weaponry becomes more precise, it seems that uh, the way that we uh, the way that we distinguish targets becomes more vague, and that's a inverse correlation that I was pretty upset about as I saw. Um, things uh, as the targeted killing program uh, picked up pace in 2010 and 2011. So in other words, as our technical sophistication uh, became better, it seemed that we were using that or uh, allowing that to double for our normative, legal, ethical way, uh, um, judgment about uh, the justification of targeting. So. In terms of operators, and to sort of drill down a little bit into the um, distance and dissociation issue that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, um, Clem Ryan, uh, who's been doing a lot of work on this, cites a 2004 Red Cross report writing, conflicts in which re uh, recourse is had to advanced technologies which permit killing at a distance or on the computer screen prevent the activation of neuropsychological mechanisms which render the act of killing difficult. Now, uh, if you thought a little bit about drone warfare, you think, oh, this is just like a video game, and this is sort of what uh, Clem Ryan's research is pushing on. But it's more complex than that, OK? So uh, in a DOD study, the Pentagon actually says that there is, there, are, there is a toll on drone operators. What the DOD describes as, in a sort of weird way, as an existential crisis, <laughs> which is, a, I mean, that's for, for the DOD. That's a, pretty, that's a pretty interesting way to describe a problem. It's not PTSD, it's an existential crisis. And I think that this is actually interesting to the extent that um, the study showed that there is still some sense 
of moral responsibility even as the um, technological loop becomes more automated. Okay? So, um, the question that uh, I'd like to ask or have begun to ask in the book is how do we get a guard against this moral hazard and how do we face the existential crisis um, that these individuals might face? Okay? Um, as I moved out of the, um, the first two articles in the Times and started thinking about the book, uh, Scott, this fellow here from the University of Oregon, invited me to talk. And um, one of the professors, uh, Bonnie Mann, said something to me that sort of stuck in my, you know, craw a little bit. So she said the, she said the following thing to me. She said, you are looking at the wrong things. You, you are looking at the leaders and the soldiers. You shouldn't be. Okay? You should be looking at the public and the, the way that the public talks about technology generally. Okay? And I think that that's an interesting point that um, she made. So when asked in 2011 where the majority of drone strikes occurred, 67% of people couldn't say where the majority of drone strikes were occurring. Okay? This was pretty, pretty, pretty alarming. Oh, good, good point. So, um, no, 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 it's great. So I, I'll follow up with you about that, but I actually think 47, the answer is I think 47% of people got the wrong answer. And the rest said, I don't know. So one of the upshots of force protection, which is what drone warfare, at least in part, is about, force protection, is that the, the public who is executing this force, in other words, the US public, does not have any flesh in the fight. Okay? So, and th that is a serious concern. Uh, back in 1780, Immanuel Kant said something about democracies. He said, democracies will tend toward pacifism. And the reason for that is their citizens want to stay out of the fight, right? And they will put, uh, they'll put uh, force on leaders to stay out of the fight except for very good reasons. But Kant was just wrong about that. <laughs> I mean, he, he's right to the extent that uh, human beings are sort of self-interested insofar as they don't want their brother or uh, sister going off to war. But that doesn't mean that they're going to stay out of war. It means that they're going to come up with clean and very efficient ways to wage it. Okay? And so what we see with drone warfare is actually uh, democratic peace theory, which has been a long-standing assumption um, in Western society, sort of come undone in certain ways. So what we see here is that clandestine activities are now uh, fairly, fairly routine. Uh, Kant says clandestine activities should never be routine. Why? Because democracies sh should push back against their leaders. Well, what technology does, certain technologies like precision guided munitions uh, and drones, it decouples the relationship between a, demo a democratic public and the leaders that uh, are supposed to fight, fight wars in their names. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. So um, when we published Drone Warfare, there was pr some pretty serious pushback against it. Uh, it two, basic, uh, two basic pushbacks. One was Hawks said that uh, military leaders and Hawks said that we were uh, undermining military, uh, the, our military forces. First, first thing they said. Uh, pushback also came from the left. And um, one thing that I'd like to talk about, um, because you folks are in the public and writing for the public, is the following statement that I got from someone. His name's Marco Roth, um, and he writes for N Plus One magazine. He writes, and this is directly toward uh, the book and uh, the writing. He says, uh, Keg forgets that the asymmetry of the conflict, our, uh, our safety, their vulnerability, debases even the most well-intentioned American writing about the war on terror. When it comes to actually committing thoughts to paper and attempting to make an existentially responsible job of it, my sense is that no matter what register I choose, polemical, realist, satirical, exoticizing, it all comes out wrong in the end. With so much real suffering occurring for so many stupid reasons, my very civilian efforts to picture the war as it now enters its 12th year become obscene by their very nature as imaginative acts. 
in other words, maybe we can talk in the, uh, I've talked for about 20 minutes, but um, it, in the question and answer, I think we should, as generally civilians among us, we could talk what sort of things can we say about this war and how might we shape the public imagination associated with drones. So on that topic, um, there are several things that we should think about. The media coverage of drones, you might have noticed in the last two years, or rather the last year at least, has not centered on the targeted killing program. What it seems that the American public is much more worried about is what? Amazon packages being delivered to their door, right? This is, like, this makes me crazy as an ethicist. I mean, and it gets to the issue that Hannah Arendt, after going to the Eichmann in Jerusalem, or rather, after writing Eichmann in Jerusalem, after going to the, um, the Nuremberg trials, says about evil. And he says that, and she says that evil is not committed by particularly evil, like, evil people like extraordinarily evil people. It's committed by very ordinary, thoughtless populations. And I think that one thing that if you could help me in the next hour or half hour think through is how do you get through the banality of evil? In other words, how do you speak to a population in such a way that they care more about the perhaps ethical arguments than about their Amazon packages being delivered on time? Like, that's a question that I'd love to figure out. Another uh, issue that I think that we're up against is what Herbert Marcuse calls technological rationality. Marcuse, uh, writing, in the 50s, uh, writing in the 50s, says that modernity is unique to the extent that it has become so mechanized. Its, its machinations are so seamless that they seem to happen inevitably and rationally and also ethically. In other words, there is a conflation between what is easy and what is good, okay? Um, and, I, and I'm wondering, how do we get over that issue? Third, and this gets close to the technological rationality, um, the conflation that we're talking about between virtue, for example, and expediency is a conflation, a longstanding conflation in the history of philosophy between the is and the ought, okay? David Hume, Immanuel Kant, says that you cannot derive an ought, a normative statement, from an is, a technical, a technical or um, factual statement. And we can talk about that. I think that technologists actually need to think about this quite a bit. Um, to what extent does the public polling and media coverage take as given about, the, about drone strikes? Um, so these three points are fairly broad. And they give like jumping off points for very, uh, very specific research about polling data. And that, that research has been uh, started by uh, my colleague Sarah Kreps. And this is what she's found. Most of the polling um, for the last seven years uh, associated with drones has shown the following. And I'll just sort of talk you through it. Most of this, say, uh, like the upshot of these graphs is that. Uh, most polls show that Americans are generally supportive of the drone program. They don't know very much about it. Sometimes they even say it's illegal, but in fact, they're, they're in favor of it. What Sarah does in, the, um, in a recent article in uh, Research and Politics, it came out last month, um, is to show that these surveys, the poll and public opinion data, takes as given two of what Sarah considers the most controversial aspects of uh, the drone strikes. The first one being um, international humanitarian law, the issue of uh, le the authorization to the use of force, one issue. And then the second issue being uh, very standard just war tenets, namely distinction and proportionality. Distinction being um, how, do we, how do we measure who is and who is not a combatant, distinction. And proportionality, is our force projection appropriate with the threat, okay? Uh, what she's finding is that uh, most of the general polls around drones take these as givens, that, that they satisfy both of these norms. But as you switch, or as Sarah, Sarah did an experiment last month, or rather was published last month, about six months ago she started it, um, when she took, um, uh, when she actually adjusted the questions to uh, focus in on distinction and proportionality, uh, respondents actually 
uh, tuned in a little more closely. And where, as you see, uh, the proportion for disapproval here, you have, um, or the proportion of approval, you have 28% when they hone in on distinction. If they say civilians, there's a large likelihood that civilians will be killed. American citizens say, whoa, hey, right? We don't like that idea. Now the question is, how do you get that into the public rhetoric surrounding drones, okay? The drones are not popular. They are not simply portable, you know, Amazon package devices, okay? Um, as she adjusts for, uh, when she adjusts um, legal authorization, for example, you see that these numbers, 39%, uh, only 39% approve, only 32% approve. Um, one thing that's interesting about the, the um, difference between IHL violations, distinction and proportionality, and legal authorization, domestic and international, is that um, it seems that Americans, when you actually paint them a picture of civilians dying, they actually care. When you, when you sort of appeal to um, international or uh, domestic authorization of use of force, they care less. In other words, um, the, 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 formal, uh, the formal normative structures don't matter as much as people are going to die. Here, let me paint you a picture, right? And, and when you paint them a picture, they actually care a bit more. So um, what Sarah is suggesting is that we need to take these uh, uh, sort of studies into account as we develop public opinion uh, data about drone strikes. So I think I'll, so I've laid out a ton of th you know, thoughts and maybe we'll have time for, uh, time for questions and comments. So thanks for having me, I appreciate it. Okay, great. Yeah. What do you think the impact would be if, if people really focus on this distinction question and then the government says, oh, no problem, we have smaller drones that are more effective. Do you think focusing on the civilian casualties risks delegitimizing the arguments about proportionality or legal authorization? Good. I mean, that's great. So I think that, that would, there, there would be that risk. But I think a part of the um, argument that she and I have made is that um, let's say we get more precise drones, as you're suggesting, and we really get the right person. Like, we're going after Bruce, and we get Bruce. <laughs> so the, the issue with that is that um, targeting practices for in the uh, targeted killing uh, campaign are interestingly vague. So for example, uh, over 16-year-old males in a combat zone, uh, combatants, covered persons, so if, if we are, uh, I would suggest that it would be a good thing if drones were even more accurate. But what I don't want to say is that it, they can do the job of figuring out who is the guilty party or not. So in other words, we actually have to get our targeting practices as specific or as precise as, um, as our technologies. To go to this a little more carefully, there's a difference between signature, signature strikes on the one hand and targeted killings on the other. Signature strikes just looks at behavior profiles. In other words, are you targeting people in a rural region in this area of the Fatah? And that, that, that's all it takes to be targeted. I'm, I'm very deeply worried about signature strikes because it actually makes this breadth. Like, lethal action is warranted because of this broad behavioral profile. I think that that's, that's a danger. I think that when, when you come to a, an official and say, this is really dangerous. Like, just being in a particular region warrants this type of lethal action. If they come back and say to you, there wasn't much collateral damage, that is not a good explanation. Okay? So it's not, so, and that is the explanation that oftentimes they, times they give you. There was, there's, uh, there's no danger to troops, and the collateral damage was very low. Not, not the point. Right? Yes? You taken the argument of efficiency to its logical end, um, which is assassination, a single bullet to a single individual that's named, uh, which has a maximum of, of efficiency and a minimum of collateral damage. Sure. How does that, how does the question, the larger and separate debate of um, assassination of foreign individuals or terrorists fit into the logical construct? No, it's good. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. So um, several lines of thought sort of get to this. One is um, 
there has been some talk of making drone operator training similar to sniper training. Um, in other words, the same psychological profile, the same moral, uh, the, the, same, the same trainings, because it's a similar type of situation. The, the other issue I think that you're getting to, though, is to what extent is assassination or what is generally known as decapitation strategy actually an efficient way of changing uh, terrorist or quote unquote terrorist behaviors? And there's been lots of debate surrounding that, right? So I would say it's not a, it's, it, it, I, I personally don't think decapitation strategy is actually the, um, is that efficient? Is that sort of getting to the question that you had? Well, I mean, there's a couple of things. I, I started with the general question, but taking us, taking us in that direction actually removes some of the technology questions around the debate that you've set up. Good. Um, yeah. Because a single bolt and a single person is old technology, and yet we still have the efficiency argument without right. the whole moral hazard around True. the technological rationalism argument that you've presented. So, in part, one of the defenders, the hawks who pushed back, said, what, you want us to put men and women in the field to get the same job done? And there's a way in which, no, I don't want to put soldiers in harm's way, but there's, there's something good about putting soldiers in harm's way, in the sense that uh, at least you have a person in the loop, a very obvious person in the loop, and there's this uh, democratic pushback against particular violations. So, I mean, it's a hard question to answer, though. All the way in the back and then here. Uh, well... I'm curious to know um, when you talk when you asked about the banality of evil and shifting public interest toward targeted killing and away from sort of civilian commercial drone use, uh, do you mean to say, I, not that I'm necessarily disagreeing with you, uh, that Amazon package delivery and civilian commercial drone use uh, are complicit in the perpetration of evil? Maybe a different, maybe a di well, so this, it's a very good question. I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to, no, no, I'm, I am going to go on the record, but it's going to take me uh, 15 seconds. To, so, um, they are complicit, I think, in two ways. Um, I think that the, um, the technology used in military devices gets moved into private sector uh, devices, and then there is this push through consumerism and capitalism to keep those devices in circulation um, and to promote them. Um, I think uh, that the drone industry generally has a vested interest in um, both military uses and private uses. And I don't think that you can separate those two off. Um, for example, like the Global Hawk, which is a high altitude um, surveillance drone, uh, the DOD didn't even want it. They said, don't give it to us. The U-2 is much better. But the lobbyists kicked in, and the, the Global Hawk went through. And that type of uh, elision between uh, commercial interests and military interests, I don't think Amazon is not complicit in that. Yeah. A comment and a question. I mean, back in the days of ICBMs, which I guess we still have, so I shouldn't like put all of the past. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there was a school of thought that um, the nuclear launch code should be surgically implanted in a volunteer soldier, um, and you know, the president be given a dagger, um, because they should literally you know, have blood on their hands if they're going to kill, you know, hundreds of millions, which, I mean, so not all the rhetoric about, um, you know, nuclear missiles was as clean, at, et cetera. And I think okay. that always sort of informs things, hmm. you know, and just sort of personalizing the, the blood on the hands. Right. Um, one thing you haven't mentioned is government secrecy. Um, which sort of shapes this in a in a large way. And, and let me give one local example. Um, I was at a workshop um, down the block um, a few years ago about you know counterterrorism strategy. This was before um, you know drones had been acknowledged by the United States government, um, and there were panels full of um, 
government officials and Harvard Law faculty who were former government officials, um, and a handful of people who were asking about drones. And you had this bizarre phenomena where you know Harvard Law faculty went mute because they knew, but they were prohibited from talking. Um, they actually had to import Stephen Carter from Yale to sort of talk plainly about drones. Right. Um, so there's this whole, I mean, you know, the government, I mean, civilian damage from, you know, collateral damage from drones, who's going to tell us that's far away and it's dangerous and the media never really does that. Um, um, you know, the people who actually know the targeting, they're not allowed to say. The people who were involved in the discussions about, you know, how targeting should be, they can't talk either. So we're sort of, you know, left with this mystery, um, you know, where all we're getting is the, you know, the, the gleaming targeted drones aimed right at those dangerous people. Right. Um, so how do you get around that, yeah. or how do you how do you address that? So I think um, there's a there was a recent study done by NYU and Stanford. It's called Living Under Drones. It's a qualitative analysis of uh, interviewing people in the FATA. So uh, I think that one way of doing that is making that that report mainstream. And the question is, how do you do that? In other words, how do you get people to look at things they really don't want to see? And I think that's I mean that's a question. Um, so. There's a type of knowing ignorance, or there's a type of uh, self-imposed ignorance about the situation. We could be much more proactive, right, um, as a public. And as academics and as media, uh, the question is, how do you get people to look at things they just don't want to look at? So uh, Ron and then, yeah, is it Ron? Yeah, yeah. That, you know, refine the saw a little bit. It seems like you know during the Vietnam War, a lot of the way that the U.S. people found out what was going on was from information that was flowing into the U.S. from the from the quote enemy side. Um, you know, there were there were anti-war groups. They you know they were fairly effective in channeling some of that some of that information from the other side into U.S. consciousness. We we don't seem to have that at the moment. Which is surprising, given that the ways of transmitting that information has become so much more sophisticated. Like, in other words, um, reporter, uh, reporters, I mean, the, the real-time nature of news today, we don't see it. And I'm, very, I'm actually quite surprised that we don't see that type. Yeah? We have data showing whether or not drones actually lead to more military as a first response. Like, because I, I think that makes sense in theory. I'm curious whether we know much about how that works in practice. Sure. Um, when so when Obama's or when Obama defended um, the A, AUMF, for example, the authorization for military force. Um, one of the defenses, and it was a sort of, to my way of thinking, strange defense is that it did not constitute traditional warfare because it did not put soldiers in harm's way. Now, I don't, so that would be anecdotal evidence, uh, but it would be a form of evidence. But I think you're right to push on, to my knowledge, there hasn't been any systematic empirical study of this, but I think, um, I'll think about it. I'll think about that. It's a good question. Yeah. So to your point, uh, or your question, with how do you get uh, Americans to understand the consequences of the civilian casualties, um, for me, I heard a uh, report on public radio that basically uh, was uh, the story of some people who, well, a Hellfire missile, and how the point of the story was that Hellfire missiles are basically weapons of terror. You hear a drone buzzing around, and it's uh, buzzing uh, over a large area. And then a Hellfire missile is launched, comes in at supersonic speed, so you don't even hear anything. There's just this big explosion. In the particular um, the story was some interviews translated to people who are obviously in tears, telling the story um, about how it hits their, their home or their hut, and a little boy's uh, body is destroyed, and his head rolls across uh, into like his sister's lap. 
And I think just right. those sort of images, uh, that very graphically, particularly when I imagined it, um, made me understand right. what the uh, civilian casualties were. I need to I, I need to say one thing I, I think this is a really interesting point but I, I and I say we say this in the book as well we are not peaceniks we're not those who are like oh war is war is always bad okay and asymmetric way but we have to be sober about what asymmetric warfare means in, in, in an age where uh, technology has allowed individual actors to get um, devastating capabilities. And that is what we're pushing against in asymmetric warfare. Those are real dangers. But so too are the real uh, stories that you just identified. Go ahead, sorry. I was going to ask about this idea of asymmetry because one thing that interests me in the example of drones is that this, there's an asymmetry of like we have drones and other countries don't, and where we're using drones in these countries that don't have the technological abilities to like. You know, uh, use the same technologies against us, for example. Right. But clearly, that's only temporary. I mean, right. It's only a matter of time before other people have drones. And so that's the first part of my question. The second part is, I'm wondering about uh, to make drones. Like, it's unlikely that we're going to go back to a point when uh, a larger percentage of the population is actually going off to war. Right? Like that seems unlikely in my view of what's going to happen. Sure. So perhaps the way that we could make drones more concrete is through cases like Amazon using drones. Um, and I'm wondering if the concern about Amazon having drones isn't so much you know, about delivery as it is about a larger area of concern for people in the United States about who has tools of surveillance. Sure. Um, so it's great. Yeah. So, so to answer or to address both of the questions, on the first point, you see Americans become much more interested when there is a concern about police use of drones or uh, drones being used to monitor the border within, uh, within the United States. Okay? And this has to do with very provincial, self-interested worries. So I, think I th it, so I think you are right to say we might use these methods to make the analogy to foreign populations. Uh, on the first point, in terms of the um, in terms of the proliferation issue, uh, Sarah has actually done a lot of work on this. Uh, she just published a report for the Council on Foreign Relations on prolifer drone pro drone proliferation, and um, I think that when other countries have these types of technologies, that will be the point when Americans begin to consider this more seriously. <laughs> unfortunately. Um, that being said, I don't, uh, I mean, uh, Sarah, one of Sarah's points is if we sensationalize the proliferation of drones, we fail to, uh, that's, that's one way that we could fail to regulate them. Uh, yes, and then yeah, Sarah. I, I don't have any questions, but I've been on the simulator, the drone simulator. Yep. And uh, my angle of looking at it is from is that it's not very dissimilar from other, what we think of as sophisticated engineering equipment. In fact, it's designed so that the person who's operating it, uh, it's so simple for them that there has to be put in place something to make sure they don't fall asleep. Right. And I mean, talking about other things like such as like those big, you know, cranes, use construction, you know, yep. cranes, and you see, and nuclear power plants. I mean, they have to switch around the valves and the pumps, the green and the light on the nuclear power plant that you have to pay attention to get done what you know needs to be done. Um, and this takes the operator, what I, from what I've seen, takes the operator and totally distances them from the, I mean, psychologically. Hmm. There's nothing that's telling you what's happening when you're operating a, a right. drone simulator. Yeah. In fact, you could actually be operating an actual drone, you know, you could be actually, you know, there could actually be real drones when you're in there. It doesn't make any difference. Right. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how that would feel. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this gets to the issue of just uh, as we move to greater forms of automa is, is sort of more autonomous forms of weaponry, what, the, what are the implications? Where does responsibility lie if collateral damage occurs in, the, in these cases? Not with the operator. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sarah, I'm sorry. Yeah. So back on the point of public consciousness <coughs> and the role in the media for kind of giving us this imaginative sense of these questions. Um, I wanted to know what your thoughts on are, are on like Hollywood and Captain America and this idea that like the latest Captain America 
their their main goal was to stop um, the launch of algorithmically targeted like aerial targets. So, was it really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. and they, there's yeah. a point at which they say like. <laughs> Yeah. The German from the previous, like, uh, that's a long story. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, he says, I created an algorithm. And so, like, <laughs> there are ways that it is becoming in the popular consciousness that this more um, non commercial application is a risk and a fear. So, what are your thoughts? Right. On that? I don't think Captain. So, I think. Um, I don't think that these uh, Hollywood versions of this get to. I mean, make. I guess they make us aware of it on one level, but no more than the question that Saw Three gets on my level that there are serious, like that there are mass murderers or something yeah. like. I mean, I don't think that it's critical. I I don't think that it's uh, critical enough to sort of get it on our radar. Um, so that would be my first point. Um, yeah. So, like, what about the Go ahead. That, you know, James Bond is always kind of a a touch on some popular context, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so I don't disagree with you there. I, I'm wondering what sort of normative work it could do, which as a philo as an ethicist, I'm like, I'm worried, like, how, how do you actually make people change their policies or make people help leaders change their policies? Um, yeah. Well, so I, that's exactly what I wanted to ask. I mean, you're putting out some really interesting research, and you've written this book. But what do you, is there an advocacy strategy here? Is there like a? If you could give me one. That would be great. <laughs> okay. No, seriously. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just I'm curious. I am, because uh, yeah, I'm absolutely. It like, so uh, one one problem with adv advocacy, as I've seen it, um, I was at NYU doing uh, a talk at the. It was it was called Dark. Uh, which is the most horrible word for a drone conference, but that's the acronym, <laughs> D-A-R-C. I was at D-A-R-C, and there were protesters outside. And uh, Code Pink, for example, was there. Or, and I don't necessarily think that these are the appropriate advocacies, uh, but I'm trying to, I, I am trying actively to think, how, does, how do academics and members of the media actually make a normative push? I've not come to any good thoughts about it yet seems like there's a lot, like it's, I think calling it a dual use technology kind of yeah. oversimplifies it, but that there is maybe something to be learned from other, yeah. you know. There is a very big one, called? but it's, but it's a drone. invite one of them to come to Well, there's a big fight over FAA regulations right. and civilian drones and whether you right. use them for whether, you know, things like looking at mines and looking at environmental degradation and so on. It's a right. big, big fight that's somewhat in the public consciousness. Yeah. So to answer your question, I don't have any quick answers, but I'd be very interested. Yeah, you were next. <laughs> so I think one element that's useful or in that conversation is that the definition and envisioning of drones is actually an area of contention in American public life with the U.S. military and the DOD and others who are actively pushing the rhetoric that you're describing of cleanliness as a strategic communications process. It's not just that it's not happening in some kind of organic way. It's happening in a very specific and intentional way. Right. And so, in a way, the, um, the data that you present about the American public's opinion on this topic is directly related to the efficiency or the effectiveness of that propaganda effort on the part of the U.S. government. Right who is trying to make it seem as if this war is indeed empty. And one way to find an alternative vision is to look at the press and the media and the conversations in the countries where those drones are landing. Yeah. So if you look at what the way that the Pakistani public talks about drones, um, you find the diametrically opposed position, which is that, um, first of all, they know that their own government's lying to them. Right. But secondly, for them, they see something very clear, which is that the value of a Pakistani life, an individual Pakistani life that's not part of an officially declared war, is less than the value of a life in an American context. And so it creates um, both a visceral, uh, both a sense of, um, kind of shaming and a sense of uh, a, a being treated as a lesser, less th lesser than human, right. but it also doesn't stop the a, a, general flow of information coming out of the FATA and the BFP about the effects of those of uh, drone attacks on civilian populations. That's so that data is very clear, and it is in the public. Yeah, that seems right. And you see 
that drone drone warfare is one of the things that m most infuriates the Pakistani public to the point of nation in influencing national politics. Yeah, mm. right. So um, it's not true that there isn't good data on what people who are attacked feel about the issue, even though they also are distorted. You know, get, get a distorted impression from their own government. Right. That's, thanks. That's a really helpful comment. I mean, yeah. Um, with respect to that, I mean, the government, I think this is the case, and I'm speaking in hand wavy terms, but like, has always known that people don't like to be faced with carnage associated with warfare. And at least since World War II, has actively controlled information that comes into the public, like, you know, telling newspapers not to print pictures of wounded soldiers and, you know, trying to, and, and I, and, and controlling public opinion using things like racism, like which, which is what we're talking about, right? Like Pakistani lives being worth less than American lives in the general sense of the American public. I mean, that's Islamophobia and racism. And it's what the sort of like, the, I, I guess we could call it pro-war argument. I'm not sure, but like right. it's, it's, the, it's the foundation of, of swaying public opinion in that direction. And I'm wondering, I mean, like what, I don't see that, that there's any reason to believe that that anyone in a position of power is any less aware than they've been before that people dislike seeing images of dead children and why we think that it might be any easier now that, I mean, as you said, there's new technologies to get information, but they're spying on all of it. Right. So, like, why we think it would be any easier for us to get that information in an unmediated way uh, without having to also combat things like racism and Islamophobia, which, as you just pointed out, right, like, rhetoric that is anti-drone in Pakistan is also kind of anti-America because America is the one with the drones. And it's very easy for a government voice to discredit that information because, you know, it's all part of this sort of generalized war. I mean, I think that the bigger problems here might not really have anything to do with drones. In, in other words, they have problems with politi systematic political, and not corruption, but just no, with warfare. I mean, yeah. I think I think the idea of that we can make this argument without saying that warfare is the problem is somewhat naive. I think what she's saying is, is a valid point, but I think that the concept of like the modern era of delivery of technological delivery of information about warfare actually goes back to the American Civil War with the birth of photography during warfare. And it was manipulated then. Yes. I'll think of it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So given the efficiency of drones, I don't see them going away. Um, and uh, I can, um, can think that it would be nice to have had drones rather than doing the carpet bombing we were doing in Vietnam. Right. We're going to fight that war. So what sort of regulatory environment would you like to see uh, for drone warfare? Yeah. So... Um, the standard non-proliferation agreements, like the Wassenaar Pact, or the um, the the regulations monitoring the international exchange of weaponry, I think should be applied to drones sooner rather than later. And Sarah's actually talked about limiting proliferation in that way. But I don't think that's the type of regime that I, as a philosopher, or me as an ethicist, think is sufficient. So, for example, about Mia's point, saying just say that war is wrong. Just say it. Like, just. And I think that's good. I think that I actually think that, um, and I've made this point before that I think that more ethical and more more attention to ethics uh, is warranted in an era of technological sophistication rather than less. Uh, we started the entire discussion about expediency and virtue. When expediency is taken care of, all there is as a backstop against transgression is our normative frameworks. And you need to like take them more seriously rather than less seriously. So I actually think that um, training, uh, training operators and tra or um, in the past, just war theory has been taught to the leaders of militaries, like officers. Uh, and this is this should continue to be the case. But I think. Um, as the technological sophistication increases, I think we need to spread the ethical training down the ranks. Uh, that's, but, but now you're asking, like you said, what would I like? Well, that would I, that's what I would like. But, um, and I would also like 
as Mia says, like I, I would like simply to have an open discussion about what the problem is with military action or what the problem is with political violence or what the problem is with the social contract. Like all of these things I would all of these things I would love. But um but I but I don't see them as like it's not gonna happen overnight, but that's why I went into philosophy, at least. I mean and and why I'm writing not about philosophy, but writing about this. And and many philosophers say to me, why are you writing about this? You should be writing about analytic epistemology. I don't it, like, but, <laughs> but, um, but I think like speaking publicly about this is actually one one thing that you could could do. Yeah. I think it's uh, really interesting that um, ISIS's strategy has been to really focus on like scenes of carnage, whereas the U.S. strategy is to completely erase them. Um, and building on that, I'm very curious to get your take on. Um, the role that Twitter and Facebook have played. Like, I know Twitter has taken down like terrorist Twitter accounts. I think it's very interesting that, like, yeah, anything uh, showing the results of drone strikes probably will be anti-American. What do you think the ethics are of Twitter? You know, dealing with taking accounts down. I think, uh, for the most part, Twitter should not take accounts down. Period. Maybe that makes me un-American, but like, I just. <laughs> I, I think that there needs to be some backstop against um, there needs to be some some backstop where we say no the surveillance or no like the, you cannot interfere with public forms of communication you just can't and 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 that means shouldering and facing risks but I think our risk tolerance needs to be a little higher as Americans uh, so for example uh, and that might mean that we allow certain things like certain Twitter accounts to remain up. So be it. Aspect of drones that's going on right now. Um, can't help but think of the establishment of the right of flyovers when they were first doing spy mm -hmm. satellites. Um, and that was, we would lie to about that in the first place. <laughs> Um, we weren't right. That was us. They said it was a science satellite, and it was, we were just trying to establish that right. So, I wonder if you see a connection between that and all of the, the commercial efforts and all the money and all the lobbying that's going into um, domestic use. Yeah, it's, that's a really good question. Um, I think that the all the discussions that we have about uh, space and the way that space is being used, like outer space is being used, needs to be seen within this complex of uh, the drone debate, for example. Because sophisticated drone technologies depend, uh, like the infrastructure required for, dr uh, for our drone program far exceeds like just, you know, drone operator uh, target. I mean, there's this whole complex network, which is supported not just by, from what I understand, is not supported just by government organizations, but also a commercial uh, commercial interests. So I think that that's one of the concerns that we should have. So the discussions about the rights in space should be taken back to what sort of uses militarily might this these inf the, this outer space infrastructure uh, have. Yeah. Okay, um that what you just said is, for me, the most um, compelling way that I think the US public imagination could be adjusted, that this other kind of spatiality, um, a, a kind of uh, mapping hmm. project, is, is, is one that I think um, is absolutely crucial for understanding the new form of invisibility. Oh, I see, yeah. That, um, and although I really appreciate your um, story of, of uh, immensely um, affecting uh, casualties and, and death, um, I think that there's also a way in which we tend to focus on um, a kind of visibility that actually um, has begun to kind of cover over. Um, the, the narrative that is much, much larger and that we need to comprehend 
in order to have this, the, no. the, the capacity for the yeah. morality that you're suggesting. Mm, interesting. Um, so I just wanted to mark that. No, that's great. No, thanks. I appreciate it. Can you talk a little bit about the culpability of like commercial drones in kind of the military industrial complex, essentially? I'm curious about what you think about culpability or non-culpability of the maker movement and its interest in drones in a civilian but not commercial sense along with that whole complex. <laughs> There's no pitchforks in the room. <laughs> no, um, but this is telecast. Um, so, um, so I, um, what do you think? No, I'm serious. Yeah, but I think it's an interesting yeah. question if we're if we're holding the commercial interest in drones culpable, why aren't we holding the production of technology and moving forward to that technology that happens in the private sector? Not well, private in terms of like not commercial sector. Right, hobbyist sector. Hobbyist sector. Right. Thank you, mm -hmm. as right. well. I I think. Um, <laughs> I, I think that uh, you're you're talking about the hobbyists, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, so, but the hobbyists in this tend to be like it's not like just you know it, it's not a nine year old kid with the thing you bought sure. from a box. Yeah, it's, anymore. Right. It's it's yeah. really serious developments in technology happening in the hobbyist sector. Right. So I would answer the question: There need to be distinctions between a reaper, a predator, drone, and a hobbyist. Mm -hmm. But there are dangers associated with each. They are different dangers. They are, or usually, they are different dangers. Um, but there are moral and legal questions surrounding the hobbyist as well. But I don't think that um, the hobbyist should push drones full. Uh, meaning, if the hobbyist goes out and says, "Well, I'm going to lobby for drones," that's there's a difference between a. Um, a little white drone this big that takes really cool pictures, but but that could deliver a some sort of weaponized or some sort of weapon, and um, a predator drone that has different capabilities. So I think that that distinction is useful. Useful. Yeah. Um, just to keep on this question and perhaps to play the devil advocate. Um, doesn't that sound a little bit like the discussion about, like, uh, say, we have the 3D printer and then people are starting arguing, okay, we should actually not put the 3D printer because people can actually create guns? Right. Um, it seems to me that it's kind of the reverse in the sense that the 3D printer has proved that it has a lot of uh, normal usage and then the evil or bad usage appear. Whereas drones, it's more the other way around. Uh, drones, we all look at them as like they are actually bad, but more and more now you have like. Amazon and whatever, so perhaps this is actually just a technology that can be used for really bad things, and we should actually prevent that usage as opposed to the technology of the drone, in the same way as we should prevent people using 3D printers to print guns, but we should not actually uh, limit the, the production of 3D printers. Yeah. No, so isn't that like connected in, in some way? It is, um, and I was afraid I'd be forced to talk about uh, hobbyists and, uh, hobbyists and <laughs> agriculture, for example. The agriculture uh, culture lobby has been emailing me for many, many years, like asking me these questions, uh, like saying, uh, what are we supposed to do? It would make our lives much easier, and I don't see any problem with this. Like, yeah, yeah. But um, so I, I, I take I take your point. I think it's a sticky issue. I don't have any fast answers for it, though. Yeah. I, mean, I, I think one thing you can say about sort of the hobbyist drone movement in this stuff is that there's something about drones that captures the public imagination, and I don't know. Flying robots, that, duh. Well, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, right. And I mean, I you know, I mean, I, I think in some ways you can overcomplicate it. I mean, people like flying robots, and you're you know, you know, you're you're, you're fighting that doesn't seem to be a particularly useful strategy. I mean, it because there are good flying robots and there are bad flying robots, and you know. The ones with the guns are more likely to be the bad flying robots, <laughs> at least some of the time. Um, the ones with the cameras are, you know, more likely to be, you know, uh, 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 are, are have the potential to be, you know, the bad ones. And you know that, uh, you know, whether it's a news organization or whatever, and you know that the one that kids launching in his backyard isn't 
you know, might break somebody's window. But, right. you know, so, I mean, they're, if it captures the public imagination, trying to sort of fight that seems to be, you know, the as a losing battle. As a philosopher, however, I have to fight that losing battle. Like, <laughs> war, it happens to people, okay? It's people waging war. It's people dying. Like, that, I mean, th that is really the upshot of what I'm trying to say. Yeah, like, in, in all of this, it's, there is a person in the loop. They are responsible. Keep, somebody is going to die, maybe. That's an issue. Like, and when Mia says, come on, like, talk about war. Fine, I'm willing to talk about war. Like, that, that's what it is. It's, it, like, if war were less bloody, it would... Uh, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Up talking about these in very binary terms, so it's either good or bad, and not somewhere on some spectrum. And especially when we're talking in the public, public consciousness. And so, how do we insert some more of this like subtlety and kind of framing that helps the public consciousness? And I don't think it occurs by just talking about drones. I think right. it occurs right. by All talking things. about yeah. ethics and people, and like asking people to have a call to responsibility, and like make it more than just me talking to 30 people, right? I mean, that's, uh, it, it, I think it takes that being important in our society. And I think that's, so to answer your question about uh, Amazon, I think that's a part of the responsibility. Amazon should be more interested in the soft side of technology and make it public. That would be good, okay? That, and I think that's, if you can hear me, that's what I'd like. <laughs> like I'm serious, that'd be awesome. And I think that you should not ask technologists necessarily to do it, but humanists, not humanists, but, but philosophers or art, uh, art, artists or sociologists or psychologists. Yeah, Mia, you have a thought? Oh, just, I just wanted to point out that, so I was actually one of the people who organized the drone conference. Dark? Yes, uh, which was largely on civilian and commercial use, and we called it dark, and it was for exactly this reason, Ooh. that we wanted to talk about commercial and civilian drone use without avoiding the subject hmm. of warfare and military drone use. Um, and just to speak to, I don't remember your name, but you're wearing a gray shirt and you have red hair. Maggie. Um, we invited a woman named Christina Dunbar-Hester to talk on a panel called uh, Right to Drones, question mark. Um, and hmm. she's done work on the hobbyist and maker communities, not specifically on drones, but on uh, radio and sort of tinkering and that kind of thing. But her, her work is specifically on sort of the ethical responsibilities of of technology hobbyists. Huh. Um, so we had that conversation, <laughs> um, which isn't to say that we can't keep having it, we should. Um, but, uh, and, and you know, so also that, uh, you know, I mean, I think what we're getting at is that, yeah, like Amazon does have a responsibility because we think that flying robots in general are a category that raise like substantive issues <laughs> that are both ethical and psychological and philosophical and moral maybe. and. Uh, and one of those many questions, one reason why I was so interested in organizing that conference is because drones aren't really the question. People were talking a lot about the drone question. But the drone question is actually like, when you say warfare, what do you mean? Because like we had a definition of war. It accrued over hundreds and hundreds of years. And it relies on very specific definitions that are no longer part of what we're talking about, which is why the president can say, you know, this isn't warfare, technically. It's something else, mm -hmm. right. right? And so I guess what I'm trying to say is that if you concede that it's war, then we're talking about war and what that is and what that means and why we do it and whether we're doing it for a good reason or a bad reason and what those are. Right. And so it's one of the many reasons why I think drones are so interesting is because they allow us to have these conversations with people. Hmm. Um, and so, I mean, I, I would... I would humbly suggest that we not be afraid to actually talk about those, especially in a space that's as safe as this, which was also kind of the point of, of organizing that conference. was like, it's hard enough to get people who have different sets of uh, interests in the same room together. It's even harder to get anyone, even among friends, to talk about these incredibly personal things. Like, what do you think is wrong about killing somebody? Do you think it's wronger to kill somebody who looks like you? You know, like, but if we can foster even a little bit of that comfort level, then people can actually start to like open up to each other. And I think that's where we actually have the important conversations that you're talking about that yeah. I agree with you definitely need to happen. Yeah. And you said that woman's name is Christina Dunbar. Dunbar Hester. It's Hester. Hester. She's gonna go. Okay. Mia, Mia, I agree with you. 
<laughs> Any thoughts, yeah, Ron? Can you tell us what the country is where the drones are most used? I'm guessing Pakistan. Right now? Well, I think that there's actually so. Well, in then it was either Pakistan or Afghanistan, depending on the numbers. Um, but right now, it's again, it's hard to determine. Determine. But uh, but the respondents were responding Iraq, Yemen, Somalia. Those were significant at the time. Those were significantly significantly wrong answers. Other thoughts? Yeah, it's good. Well, thank you all. Thanks. Thanks a lot for. Having me.